Hello friends and welcome to another edition of Transformational Astrology. We're going to be talking about this full moon which is happening tonight, um, only in a few more hours actually, uh, some eight hours from now. And uh, <clears throat> when we look at this full moon, we're going to find out that there's a lot of outer planet uh, correspondences, connections, as we have been seeing in all of these lunations. They've just been so powerful. Uh, you remember that the um, new moon that we were looking at uh, recently, uh, the October 19th new moon last month, uh, <clears throat> that the sun and moon uh, in their position in the new moon actually uh, were exactly opposite to Uranus in the sky. So <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. Um, that exact opposition is is makes it very close. You know, it's very close, obviously, and makes it very strong. So we've been seeing unexpected events of all kinds. Um, you can see it in the body politic. You can see it in your own personal lives. Synchronicities are on the rise. Uh, you can see synchronicities everywhere. I feel, um, of course, we're also paying attention right now and looking for them. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I want to mention that uh, in this full moon that we're going to be looking at in just a minute, uh, Venus, which rules Taurus, the moon is in Taurus, opposite the sun in Scorpio now, almost the midpoint of Scorpio. Venus is uh, opposite to Uranus very precisely, uh, within a minute of a degree. <laughs> so we have, uh, you know, the, I'm not just flapping my jaws here and saying there's a lot of outer planet stuff. There's outer planet stuff in spades and happening in a very um, unusually close connection. You know, to have two planets in the sky be 180 degrees different from each other within a minute <laughs> is, is pretty unusual. I mean, and the timing of the full moon. Of course, it happens every time there's an opposition. There's some point of exact of the opposition. But <clears throat> the significant thing is that this is happening at the same time as we have the full moon in Taurus, which Venus you know, it rules Taurus. Venus and Taurus are very similar in that way. They're connected. Well, <clears throat> let's see. Um, I think it has something to tell us about the kind of stage that we're in right now, where we are at with the society that we're living in. Um, how can we deal? You know, how can we manage our own feelings? <clears throat> it tells us something about where we're at, too, individually, of course, as well, which is you know, in, in some ways even more important. But uh, we're all um, affected by what we what we perceive around us. You know, in, <clears throat> here in California, we've had terrible wildfires in Houston and in uh, Florida and Puerto Rico. They've, they've had a lot of flooding with the hurricanes. Um, there was an earthquake in Mexico. It just goes on and on. It's just been so intense all around the world. Uh, not to mention what happened in New York <clears throat> just this past uh, Halloween, just a few days ago. So um, let's take a look at the chart and see what we can see and see if that helps us to understand a little bit better what we're dealing with. So <clears throat> you should be able to see the chart now on your screen. And, uh, you know, once again, here is that position of Venus, which is 25 degrees of Libra in 55 minutes. And by George, uh, Uranus is 25 degrees of Aries in 54 minutes. That's 180 degrees apart, uh, to precisely, <laughs> except for one minute. And uh, with Venus uh, and, and Uranus also in combination, we would want to hasten to mention we have a, another one of these inner planet and outer planet uh, combinations. They bring to our sense of aesthetic, uh, to our sense of how our relationships are unfolding. Uh, Venus is in Libra, which is the sign of relationships as well. Venus rules Libra. Uh, it brings that Uranian, Uranian um, wild card into, into the, the factor. So uh, we find that um, in typical um, existing relationships, some factor is altering. You know, there's a way that if we can see the change and we can see the change coming and we can feel the change without being afraid of it, without... Uh, panicking without trying to resurrect what there was, um, but instead kind of welcoming the possibility of, of change, the possibility of something new coming along, maybe quite suddenly, maybe quite surprisingly, maybe something you didn't know and you found out, maybe something you didn't recognize or realize about your partner. Uh, and it can be very beautiful and very opening. And, you know, if you both ride with it, ride that roller coaster, you can find a, a new a new dawn in, in what's going on with you too. 
So that's a powerful thing. And of course, <clears throat> it affects single people as well. There's all kinds of possibility in the air. There's all kinds of um, things kind of coming coming along that uh, open up to new new ideas. New, you know, you might meet somebody. So <clears throat> all that is in the background of this full moon. Um, we do have, you know, the sun and the moon opposite at almost 12 degrees, but it's still 11, 11 and the very end of 11, the 11 degree mark. We call it the 12th degree, uh, counting from one, you know, not zero, but one. And so we have um, the sun and moon opposite. Uh, anytime there's a full moon, we have a flowering of what was already in play in the, in the two weeks of the, of the lunar cycle preceding this point. Um, it comes to some kind of culmination. And there's a relationship involved in that too. Anytime you have an opposition, it reflects on relationships. So there's a big relationship orientation. Actually, um, Scorpio is good for that too. And we have Jupiter and Scorpio now. So, you know, this is the eighth house, uh, naturally. It's, it's, these are the natural houses. This is not the actual rising uh, of the chart, you know. And anytime you see Scorpio or the eighth house, you see depth. You see your, your own depths and the depths of others, which, of course, is what relationship really is all about, is the intensity of that uh, inner connection with ourselves, with other people. Um, and by George, look, uh, Neptune is also involved in this configuration. So we have Neptune at 11 degrees also, uh, Pisces, which therefore is sextile. The moon is sextile. The sun is trine, this position, which brings a, a great deal of prominence to Neptune, which we've been seeing with the full moons lately, of course. And then uh, we also have a lot of Pluto in this configuration, just to add to the uh, outer planet stew that we have going on. Namely, um, it's a little more subtle, but if we look at the parallels, um, we right-click in the Time Passages software on Pluto, we are, see what the declination is, which is 21.8 minus 21.8, and we have the parallel shown to Mercury and to Saturn. And just to show you, so 21.8 and Mercury, 21.3, so that's half a degree off. So this is a strong parallel between Mercury and Pluto. Uh, Pluto is also cl closely parallel to Saturn. That's kind of fading now. Saturn's moving on. The declination is slowly changing away from Pluto's. Um, Saturn is at 22.4 now. But, you know, um, even, even so, we still have that connection, which tells us that um, the structure of things is changing rapidly with Pluto and Saturn involved with each other, <clears throat> as they will be at the end of the decade when they're conjunct to each other. So, um, with Jupiter as well. So, <clears throat> and then it turns out that also Jupiter is making a quintile aspect to this Pluto degree, which you can see, again, in the time passages, if you put your mouse right there where the line is, I, I don't know if you can read it on the screen, but it says Jupiter and quintile within 0.2 degrees with Pluto. So that's, again, quite close, uh, this particular aspect is. And the, the sun and moon in general are uh, also an aspect to Pluto as well as to Neptune, because Pluto and Neptune are in a vague sextile with each other. It's, it's getting kind of close now. It's only six degrees apart. Um, and the sun and moon are making the trine and the sextile to uh, Neptune, but they're also making a sextile and a trine to Pluto. So Pluto is quite active in this, in this chart. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, the ambassadors of the galaxy, uh, Dane Ridger called them, it's... Uh, a way that we find that we transcend our current uh, selves, our kind of superficial reality, day-to-day -day -day personalities, um, into something along the lines of transpersonal experience, something deeper, connecting to the concept that there's magic afoot, that everything that happens, even coincidental, um, you run into somebody or the light changes just as you have a brilliant idea. Um, <clears throat> these things convey messages to us when we're paying attention to them. And people like Carl Jung paid attention to the messages. They were very much aware that not only when somebody made a statement to them that they could listen to and take into their thought process, when the universe also made its mentions uh, in terms of uh, a dead bird lying on the lake just when you were drawing that bird in, in, in part of your dreams, and then you find the living example of it right there. 
or the, in this case, the physical example of it right there with this dead bird that looked perfect except that it just passed. Uh, that's something that Jung talks about when he was doing his journals, when he was working uh, with depth, you know, with dreams and with uh, the unconscious. And actually, um, in terms of Rash society, I think it's very interesting to note that we have all these outer planet connections, which includes Saturn, by the way. Saturn is very close trying to, to Uranus right now. You can see almost 25 degrees, so that's only a degree off. So <laughs> um, all of these planets, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, they're all quite involved in these configurations, including Eris, by the way, which is close to uh, actually... 23 and 25 are the degrees of Eris and Uranus, and then Saturn is at 24. So that's coming together um, also, so we do have Eris in this mix. So all these outer planet energies are very strong right now, and they're all <clears throat> kind of uh, nudging us in the direction of, of where we might be able to evolve, spiritually evolve. <clears throat> I brought a quote. I actually have a quote that I want to read to you from Joseph Campbell. And I think you'll find this very interesting. This is in the Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is Joseph Campbell's major work when, when uh, he was in his 40s. And when the, actually when the decade was, in, when the century was in its 40s, uh, 20th century. So he has a line in here where he talks about the disintegration of society. And he says, um, as Professor Arnold J. Toynbee indicates in his six-volume study of the laws of the rise and disintegration of civilization, schism in the soul, schism in the body social, will not be resolved by any scheme of return to the good old days, which is archaism, or by programs guaranteed to render an ideal project of some thought, which is futurism. And then he says, or even by the most realistic, hard-headed work to weld together deteriorating elements. And I find, <clears throat> I find that fascinating because here we are, we're trying to patch it up, right? We're trying to get corruption out of the government. We're trying to get money out of politics. We're trying to adhere to a better way of doing things within the current system. But this quote says... Uh, it won't happen. You know, you can't really make the changes you want even by the more realistic, hard-headed, the most realistic, hard-headed work to weld together, again, the deteriorating elements. It goes on, only birth can conquer death. The birth, not of the old thing again, but of something new. So within the soul, there must be a recurrence of birth. It is by means of our own victories, if we are not regenerated, that the work of Nemesis is wrought. Doom breaks from the shell of our very victories. Peace, then, is a snare. War is a snare. Change is a snare. Permanence is a snare. When our day is come for the victory of death, death closes in. There's nothing we can do except be crucified and resurrected dismembered totally, and then reborn. So I think that's a very telling quote. Um, I was startled when I read it at how apropos it is to our current situation right now. And we are experiencing this death and rebirth represented by Pluto, represented by these outer planets, um, quite strongly, I, I feel. I mean, we can see <laughs> we can see things falling apart <laughs> all around us. I, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty convinced of that in the... Uh, Washington, D.C. situation right now. We see evasions and scrambling and indictments and all kinds of stuff going on there. Uh, and in our own lives as well, we may feel a little chaotic. You know, we may feel like uh, this is the end of things, you know, the end of civilization, uh, you know, the end of the planet with global warming coming at us. And so um, in times like these, it's necessary to kind of buck up and see what the spiritual message is. This is the province of these outer planet energies. What is the spiritual message of what we're involved in right now? And it involves these new planets as well that we're starting to study. Um, I'll give you a little tour. You know about Eris because I talk about it all the time. Eris is a spiritual warrior, a feminine warrior energy for deep soul intention. 
And it means standing up for oneself and standing up for what one believes against the current of the prevailing, against the current if necessary, and it usually is necessary, of the prevailing social matrix. So no matter what the consensus thinking is, you've got to find your own way. You've got to find your own way through, not listen to what everybody is saying, but really listen to what your own heart is saying. This is what I believe. This is what I must do. And then these other two um, new ones, there, there are three that were named in the Kuiper Belt as planets, and they are beyond Pluto. I mean, Pluto was also called a dwarf planet at that point. There, All these Kuiper Belt trans-Neptunian planets are called dwarf planets because they are on a smaller scale and because they had to be politically the IAU, which is the astronomical body, uh, International Union of Astrologers, <laughs> sorry, International Union of Astronomers, I mean to say, um, designated these new ones uh, as dwarf planets so that there wouldn't be any mistake between we have the planets, the ones that we're used to, and then we have all these new ones that may be named. So, so far, though, three have been named, and they're the three largest ones in the Kuiper Belt. And one of them is Eris, as I've been saying, and that's the largest. That's really the same size as Pluto, maybe a little bigger. It's also more massive and brighter and much further out. It's 550-year orbit. Then we have, um, this is Haumea, which is close to Venus right now and participating in all this outer planet energy. And it has to do with profound connection with nature. It represents, um, <clears throat> the, the name comes from the mythology of Hawaii. It's the creation goddess of Hawaii, the mother of Pele, uh, the source of all the fecundity of animal and bird life and plant life that we see in the islands, you know, which is quite diverse. Um, <clears throat> so as in that, you might guess that it represents a profound connection with nature, the recognition of the importance of nature. And of course, that's very up right now for us. Uh, this, this other symbol here, which is close to Mars right now, is Maki Maki, which is uh, another one of these larger dwarf planets. These two have, orbs, <laughs> have orbits uh, that take them about 300 years to go around. So a little bit more than Pluto, but in the same general category not 556, which is the way uh, Eris is, which is much slower, especially right now when it's so far out on its limb. It's, it's at the furthest point from its, in its, in a, in its elliptical orbit, it's the furthest point. So actually, um, it's taking a very long time to go through Aries. But um, these guys move faster, and they're in Libra right now. And anyway, um, Maki Maki, also uh, indigenous, uh, does reference, again, the profound connection with nature and with the activism to try to do something about it. In other words, um, that society in, in Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island culture, is famous for being without their trees. They had cut down all their trees or there had been deaths of all their trees from blight uh, and they were in a bad situation when they were discovered by, um, I think it was the Portuguese. But in any case, or maybe it was Captain Cook. But anyway, they were discovered by Europeans, and at that point they were no trees, they could not make canoes, they could not fish, they were really in trouble. And so I think this comes to represent, I mean, not just from that one story, of course, but in all the research I've done, I've looked at a lot of environmentalists, and um, it's prominent um, many times. I mean, I could go on to examples, but it, there's no time for that today. But um, so this is fascinating that these new planetary entities that are beyond Pluto, beyond Neptune, called TNOs or trans-Neptunian planets, um, really have something to say to us now in our current situation. So new planets come along when the time is right <clears throat> for them. Uh, they come along when um, things are changing, as we have seen in the 1930s with the discovery of Pluto. Things were rapidly changing. There were some dire situations arising at that time, including the atomic bomb, which was being developed and which exploded in 45, as everybody knows, I'm sure. Well, <clears throat> that's mostly what I wanted to say about this chart. Um, we do want to have time for questions today also. And um, I think that kind of sums up where we're going with this. Um, maybe I'll switch back away from the chart. Let's see. So do, do we have any questions that came in? We do. Okay, what, you, what we got? The first question 
is from Marcia. She asks, if you are having difficulty feeling settled or living in the wrong place, how would this show up in your chart as if there's a dissonance in your living situation? Well, you know, actually, <clears throat> difficulty in feeling settled is exactly what I've been talking about because of Uranus. Uranus, um, which uh, Jeff Green called freedom from the known, it's one way it's recognized, um, <clears throat> is a restless energy. I mean, basically, it's saying your standard old, good old rut that you're in just isn't working uh, for you, and you, you need to jump the tracks. So that is one, I wouldn't say that's the only indication of, of being unsettled. Um, Aquarius in general, which is the sign ruled by Uranus, uh, can be that way. It can be sudden, sudden shifts in career or in relationship even. Um, so you might look to the house that Uranus, uh, own, uh, Uranus is the natural ruler of, namely wherever Aquarius is on the cusp of, of that chart, of that house. Um, so those are the two major indications I can think of at the moment. Mercury has also got a restless attitude uh, moves around a lot, you know, so you could look for aspects to your natal mercury as well. Another one? Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next mm -hmm. question is from Kim. She asks, will this full moon affect other planets that are in Taurus in your natal chart? Thanks. Absolutely. And usually what we do in Western is we say the closer, the better. In other words, if it's six degrees or less, that's that's a consider a conjunction of if it's in Taurus between um, six degrees of Taurus and 18 degrees of Taurus, that would be very close to the position of the moon. If your Mars is in Taurus and it's within those bounds, you might feel a lot of energy, a lot of excitation, excitement. Whatever planet it touches, anytime a full moon touches a, a sensitive point in your chart, including ascendant, uh, including all of them, actually the nodal axis of your chart as well, um, it's going to be definitely a factor and look for a culmination you know there's there's a way that this is also if you're reflecting on where your life is taking you it's reflecting on uh, it's indicating rather some kind of culmination coming along so that's an important thing to, to recognize and think about that's the difference between the full moon energy and the new moon if you have a new moon on at any point in your chart it's also of course important awesome thank you the next question is from John. He asks, how do you interpret natal Saturn conjunct natal Jupiter? Well, that means you were born around 20-year mark, <laughs> you know, 1940, 1960, 1980. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is, uh, these are the social planets. So when you see uh, Jupiter and Saturn together, as you do in the birth of John Lennon, for example, John Lennon was born in, in 1940 under the Saturn a Jupiter conjun conjunction, which is a 20-year cycle, and uh, <clears throat> rose to prominence under another Jupiter-Saturn conjunction cycle in the 60s, the early, the early 60s, when the Beatles came along and changed everything, and then died under under a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in 1980. So it shows how it really is connected to his life, and he was a very social activist uh, oriented person. You know, I mean, that's if you think of John Lennon, you think of how he really tried to change things for the better, how he really made his mark, how he, he was uh, a little bit scary to the establishment because of it, and uh, especially in his solo work after the um, after the Beatles, you know, there, there's quite a bit of, uh, of activism indicated in that. <clears throat> it's just being very tuned in, it doesn't have to be activist, but just being very tuned in to the social milieu that you come up in, and uh, how you can see that changing. And you can see that also in Capricorn, which is the same as Saturn, that namely Jupiter being enthusiasm, being future orientation in connection with Capricorn, which is the same symbol as Saturn really, um, indicates that the society which surrounds you, that you're so tied to, is a object of great study for you, something you're very interested in working with, something you'd like to see in some kind of an idealized fashion. You know, you'd like to see things go for the better, things change for the better. <clears throat> yeah. Wonderful. The next question is from Patricia, and she is here live with us. She asks, what are the differences between astrocartography and relocation charts? Which do you believe is more accurate for interpretation? Well, they're both the same thing. Uh, astrocartography shows you where you might look <clears throat> for your relocated chart to be a certain 
Now, a relocated chart is actually, I think, a better way, especially if you know where you're going to be looking. In other words, if you're thinking about, gee, I might move to Chicago, what's that going to be like for me? What you want is a relocated chart, which is easy to do in the Time Passages software, by the way. Um, <clears throat> all you have to do is go to Display and choose it. Uh, we could, we can even go there, I guess, and, and show how that works. So let's see. We'd want a personal chart of some kind <coughs> rather than a full moon chart. And I want to use a chart that the person wouldn't mind me using their chart. Now this is a sunrise chart, actually. So it's a chart for a certain time, EST, for Flint, Michigan, where Michael Moore was born. But we can also display the relocated chart by choosing out of the display menu, relocated chart. And let's say we're going to experiment with the West Coast, which I recommend. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> which was where we live. And you can see that uh, you have to remember the original chart. Michael Moore originally has, you know, because we did this chart specifically for the time of sunrise, he has two degrees of Taurus rising. So we're going to keep that same time. And now uh, it moves a little bit by the relocation. And so we have, um, instead of Taurus rising, we have 27 degrees of Aquarius rising. Oh, wait a minute. This isn't right. Because the, the sun should still be at two degrees of Scorpio. So, hmm, I don't know what's going on there. This is a new version of the software. Maybe there's a problem with it. <laughs> So remember how I was saying that surprises can happen? It was definitely a surprise to me because I had no idea there was any problem with that. But what we can do is we can bring back this is the shipping version of time passages here. Let's see if it works better this time. It may be because we're doing a sun, sunrise chart too. But. <coughs> or maybe we were looking at the wrong chart there. I'm not sure what we did there. You could do John Lennon since you were just talking about him. Well, we don't want to go too far afield. Yeah, now you can see what I was trying to talk about. Here's the sun at two degrees of Taurus, which was where it was in his original chart. And now we do have Aquarius rising. So there was something wrong with that calculation. I'll have to go look at that. That's in a brand new version that we haven't shipped yet. So I'm not too worried that anybody's running into that. And then um, <clears throat> the fact that the houses change means that things are different. And you have a concentration on the 11th house with the moon and Mars conjunction and the North Node. So that would be in a different place if we go back to your natal. Not yours, of course, but Michael's. And we look at Michael's natal and we see that it's in the ninth house. So things change housewise. Now, if you're going to be looking at um, the astrocartography, you're going to be seeing all the lines where a planet is either culminating, which means with the midheaven, or at the descent. And actually, I can show you that too. So if we go to, in, in the natal chart, if we go take a look at Astro Maps here, we'll see, and we can drill down. So we notice that there's no lines right there on the west coast. There was no planet that was either on the ascendant, descendant, or the midheaven. But um, let's see if we expand this a little bit. So we, we wonder how it would be for him in this southern part of uh, Alaska and it looks like Jupiter would be on his descendant. So this would be kind of a good place for him to go. Now, so you see how this is useful if you're trying to see where is my vacation spot that I'm really going to have some interesting experiences of a particular kind. Um, but, you know, if you're already thinking about moving to um, parts of Alaska, see, I wonder if the cities would show up if I expand some more. Well, we're spending a little too much time on this, I think, but 
you know, what you would want to do is take a look at a city in this path, and then when you do the relocated chart, you'll find that Jupiter is on the descendant anywhere along this line. So that's what the astrocartography will do for you. And, uh, you know, like nothing's going through Portland for him, so it's not going to show up. Now, even though it doesn't show up on the, ascent, on the midheaven, you can see that it's still important when you look at the relocated chart because this stellium, for example, moves to the 11th house, and this is a different place. It would be somewhere where he was more activist, let's say. And sure enough, on the West Coast, he's been pretty activist, I guess. But that's, that, that's enough of that for now, I think. So we'll just... You want to do a few more questions? Yeah, we can do a few more, sure. Okay. The <clears throat> next question is from Elizabeth, and she's also here live with us. She's having an interesting month here, or must be. She says, this full moon conjunct my south node and Jupiter in the 11th house. Do you have any thoughts on that? The last one was on my natal moon. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> yeah, you're having some changes going on. What were the uh, planets again? South node and Jupiter. Oh, yeah. So you're having a Jupiter um, event, <laughs> you would say. <laughs> Uh, you already have a Jupiter event built into your natal chart with the south node and Jupiter in combination. It's something you're very familiar with. You're a basic optimist, you know, cheerful, you look on the bright side. Uh, you have a spiritual bent. You know, you're a futurist. You like to see things change uh, in a better, in a productive way for the future. And all these things are accentuated with the full moon. So this is something that comes into your emotional awareness, you could say. Something you're uh, dwelling upon right now. If you're alive, maybe you can respond to that and see if it makes sense to you. <clears throat> if you have time to do that. And then um, <clears throat> we'll move on to another question in the meantime. Okay. Um, the next question we have is from Kathy. She asks, what is a summarized chart? I don't know. Me either. <laughs> I mean, I can only think that, uh, you know, you could, you could say sun, moon, rising. You know, that's a summary of the chart. If this particular chart that we have in front of us is the chart we're talking about, we'd say, well, you've got the sun in Scorpio, oh. but you've got the moon in Taurus. I bet you misunderstood you. I bet she's asking about sunrise chart. Oh, okay. And it sounded like summarized. Well, if you were talking about sunrise chart, that was the case with Michael Moore. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know the time of birth, you can do a sunrise chart. And the reason we do that is because it still presents a decent look at a chart. I'll show you just real quick here. Um, Michael Moore, where are you? Michael, oh, here we go. So um, in this case, you see we're identifying the, the, the rising point with the sun degree. And it's just something when you're editing the chart, you can choose. You can say, um, I'd like a sunrise chart, please. And there you go. And otherwise, you can put the time. If you don't know the time, though, see, this is a way you can still look at the chart. It's basically, we're looking at it from the standpoint, not of the rising point, which is a sensitive point, which we don't know precisely what was rising, but from the standpoint of the um, starting from the sun, looking at the first house being the sun's house or, or Taurus, and then the, se the second house being Gemini, the third house being Cancer, and so on. So it's one way of, this is definitely a chart that's worth looking at. You know, it's, it's a chart, even though um, we might have the time, we might look at this chart too, because it's a valuable chart for um, looking at the person, especially a person with an early Taurus rising like that, because by putting the cusp on two, it's pretty much the whole sign. You can also use whole sign houses with this too, but that's what that's about. Okay. Cool. Um, Elizabeth <clears throat> is responding to your interpretation. She says, I do. You are right. She's looking for changes in her professional and spiritual life. She's a Gemini sun and Aries moon. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. That's all the questions that we have for now. All right. Well, <clears throat> I think we'll probably close then at this point. We've been talking for a while. Um, now it's my turn to summarize. <laughs> How would I summarize? Um, <clears throat> I think it's so important that we recognize, you know, I talk about Eris a lot, which has just come up recently in, in our studies of astrology and uh, does refer to each individual taking action as necessary for what they deeply believe. And you can see the examples in people's lives, people that have strong ears like feminists. All the feminist leaders that I looked at um, have strong ears one way or another. 
And, uh, you know, it's time to really um, get, well, get active for one thing. I mean, we just don't have the luxury of apathy any longer. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, it's been said that uh, those on the right wing are more energized than those on the left. You know, the liberals are kind of milling around and looking at the daisies, you know, and it's time to get active for them too. And if you're conservative, it's time for you to be active. It's time for everybody to take charge because um, things are kind of going south uh, without that. So um, everybody needs to stand up and be counted. Don't skip voting, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Look what happens, you know. <laughs> but um, beyond that, in our personal lives as well, um, the spirit of transformation that we're dealing with um, really uh, is so important and, and, so, and so difficult. You know, I mean, we get into our habitual ways of doing things and we're just not ready to change. You know, um, thank you very much. We're very peaceful and happy doing things the way we're doing them, even though we may recognize either subliminally or overtly, or we've talked about it many times with our therapists or friends, counselors of all kinds. It is something you need to work on and something you need to change. And you just, you know, the, no time like the present. So, um, and that's what these continual outer planet configurations um, in these lunations are really telling us, that this is, this is a pivotal decade, uh, and this is a pivotal time in this, in this pivotal decade of the, of the 20-teens, you know, um, leading up to 2020. Um, this is a make-or-break situation with the society, and I think everybody's feeling the pinch. It's time for everybody to get real, and you can do that. You know, it's possible. It's very possible to get real. So, here's to the reality in your life. Huzzah. Thanks. See you next time. <laughs>